At the Bloomberg New Economy Forum today, Prime Minister Lee Sen Loong offers his view on what US President-elect Joe Biden should do to reset relations with China. Now, something unique to us, Singapore's soccer culture moves one step closer to being globally recognised as a key part of our heritage. And from giving the best advice to explaining new policies, ST Smart Parenting will help you help your child succeed. It's 5.30pm here in Singapore. You're watching The Big Story coming to you live from the Straits Times newsroom. I'm Harianto Dima. Now you can subscribe to the Straits Times channel so you never miss a single episode. With the world watching on, Joe Biden is expected to be sworn in as US President on January 20th. Global leaders, including Singapore's Prime Minister Lee Sen Loong, will be paying close attention to how Mr Biden reshapes foreign policy. In a wide-ranging interview that aired today, PM Lee spoke to Bloomberg News Editor-in-Chief John Mickelwitt at the Bloomberg New Economy Forum. Let's bring in Associate Editor Ravi Velo to discuss this further. Hi Ravi. Now Ravi, one of the main topics of the interview was on US-China ties, particularly on what US President-elect Joe Biden should do on building that relationship. Now let, let's listen to what PM Lee said. Asia is a very important part of the world for America and China particularly. I hope that he will be able to focus his mind on developing a framework for an overall constructive relationship with China. And within that framework, deal with trade, deal with security, deal with um, climate change, deal with non-proliferation, uh, North Korea, all the many issues which the two two biggest powers in the world have to focus on. And amongst those will also be issues which will be concern, of concern to all the rest of us in Asia who are watching carefully to see how things will develop because the last four years have been quite a tumultuous ride. So Ravi, we just heard uh, PM Lee describing the last four years as tumultuous. How do you think Washington and Beijing can reset their relationship under the new US administration? Well, there's no doubt uh, that the uh, last four years that uh, uh, under President Donald Trump has been uh, more than tumult. It's been confusion and chaos and uh, uh, absolute uh, disruption in, uh, 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 in so many ways. And there's a lot of uh, uh, damage, a lot of healing that needs to be done. Um, some of it is uh, highly achievable. Uh, but if you don't get it right, uh, I think uh, uh, at the same forum that uh, PM was speaking, uh, Dr. Henry Kissinger was uh, also uh, mm, uh, interviewed by, uh, by the uh, editor-in-chief of uh, Bloomberg, and he described the current situation as something close to uh, what went on before the First World War, that was uh, before in the run-up to 1914. So mm -hmm. things are very dire. There's no doubt about it. Uh, and uh, uh, if ever a situation needed a reset, it is the uh, U.S.-China relationship. Uh, well, Mr. Biden uh, is not unfamiliar with China or with uh, President Xi Jinping. Uh, if I remember, his first uh, trip uh, to uh, China was uh, uh, back in 1979 uh, when uh, uh, he was a senator. And uh, I think he had a meeting with Deng Xiaoping at that point. Uh, subsequently, as uh, uh, vice president under Obama, he uh, held meetings with uh, then Vice President Xi Jinping. And then when presidency came to um, uh, America, uh, Joe Biden accompanied him uh, around the country. So they do have, uh, uh, they are familiar with each other, they know each other. Uh, but the thing now to do is to, uh, as uh, in fact, in fact, uh, uh, Dr. Kissinger suggested the same thing. He said, well, you use back channels to uh, uh, open a dialogue. Uh, first decide on what's at stake and then try to uh, go for what is achievable. Ravi, PM Lee also spoke on the recently signed Regional Comprehensive Economic Partnership, or RCEP, and the significance of such regional trade agreements. It is a significant step towards reducing trade barriers and facilitating trade between these economies, and also a significant statement that in Asia, whatever happens in the broader world, we would like to promote regional integration and we do believe in a 
model of cooperation and win-win trade rather than in going it alone and beggar thy neighbor, which in these troubled times is worth quite a lot. So Ravi, this is a two-part question. Uh, do you think with regional trade agreements like RCEP, there is a possibility of the global world divided into a much more regional one? And what is the significance of such agreements to Singapore? Well, I think the first thing is for the region that uh, because there's such uh, uh, doubts about multilateralism uh, which have been uh, spawned uh, uh, largely by the United States and uh, uh, President Trump's uh, behavior since taking office, uh, regions have to do what they can to keep uh, the engine of uh, trade, engine of multilateralism uh, moving. Um, while uh, things are done to fix the WTO and uh, other larger issues, uh, I don't think um, it is going to divide the world, but uh, it means that a part of the world will uh, try to do what it can for itself while waiting for the rest of the world to catch up. Uh, and uh, that is the significance of uh, deals like RCEP. For Singapore itself, well, uh, it makes a statement. Uh, Haryanto, as you're probably fully aware that uh, Singapore is the most trade-driven eco trade driven economy in the world. Yeah. Uh, trade is more than 300% of our gross uh, domestic product. So we are critically dependent on trade. So anything that keeps economies open, keeps the trading system going, uh, is good for us. Uh, specifically, RCEP may not do uh, uh, a whole lot for us because we have very high quality uh, trade deals uh, with more than 20 countries. But uh, we, that doesn't stop us from signing uh, even what might seem insignificant trade deals like uh, the uh, Singapore-Sri Lanka trade accord. The important thing is to keep trade open, to keep those channels open and not allow them to close uh, in any way. Right. Uh, Ravi, now let's uh, move to the topic of uh, Singapore because uh, the interview also touched on uh, Singapore's next budget. PM Lee said that we are unlikely to see a balanced budget, let alone a surplus. Uh, what do you think the budget in February will look like then? How big a deficit will well, it be, you reckon? Well, it's, it's not for me to guess. Uh, uh, what's on the mind of the finance minister. Uh, we don't know the data yet. Uh, we do know that uh, we have had a very bad uh, second quarter and um, uh, hopefully things will start to pick up now that uh, 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 certainly sentiment is improved uh, because uh, uh, more than one COVID vaccine seems to be on the horizon, but it hasn't translated uh, into the economy yet. At the moment, it's at the level of sentiment. So we do not know how long the uh, hand-holding of businesses and, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, job support and, uh, uh, you know, rental support and all these things can continue. Uh, one thing is for sure, they cannot go on forever because everybody runs out of money at some point, even uh, a well-funded economy like uh, the Singapore government and a well-funded government like Singapore, uh, uh, which has uh, built up reserves thanks to years of uh, prudence. Um, so that's one part of it. Uh, the second part of it is that, uh, uh, you know, you have to uh, allow the animal spirits to thrive and you cannot uh, foster a culture of uh, uh, dependency on government uh, for too long because it, uh, it, it comes back to uh, uh, harm the quality of entrepreneurship uh, on the island. So I'm sure the finance minister uh, happens to be uh, DBM. Uh, Heng will have to think through all these issues and uh, come up with uh, uh, a, a, a good enough solution now when the budget, budget is presented. Well, thank you so much, uh, Ravi, for the valuable insights. Always a pleasure to speak with you. We've been speaking to The Straits Times Associate Editor, Ravi Velour. Now, you can read all about Prime Minister Lee Sen Lung's interview at the Bloomberg New Economy Forum on straightstimes.com. An update on the COVID-19 situation here. Six new cases were confirmed today, all of whom were imported and were placed on stay-home notices on arrival in Singapore. Now, this is the seventh straight day that there are no new cases in the community and from workers' dormitories. More details will be released tonight. 
In other local news, an ongoing study by local researchers found that the SARS-CoV-2 virus, which causes COVID-19, can survive in sufficiently high amounts on frozen fish, chicken and pork for three weeks at refrigeration temperature. It was found that the virus was able to survive and remain infectious at refrigeration and freezer temperatures, that is 4 degrees Celsius and minus 20 degrees Celsius respectively, for three weeks. As such, it is possible for the virus to survive transport and storage, which occur in controlled settings with consistent temperature and humidity levels comparable to that of a lab. The research team is also studying the possibility of infection by consuming food that has been contaminated with the COVID-19 virus. Meanwhile, the Singapore Tourism Board is investigating a possible breach of safety measures at the Resorts World Sentosa Hotel. Videos of a group of at least six women and a man were uploaded on social media on Sunday when they allegedly held the party. Some of the women had uploaded several videos on Instagram showing themselves play fighting with pillows and clothes on beds. An RWS spokesman said it takes a serious view of non-compliance and requires all guests to be registered with the hotel front desk. This is the second such gathering at RWS that has allegedly breached safe management rules in as many months. Under a new advisory to tackle mental health concerns of workers here, companies are encouraged to organise talks and workshops on the issue and train managers to spot signs of distress. The Tripartite Advisory on Mental Well-Being at Workplaces also calls on employers to recognise the need for staff to have adequate rest outside work hours. This can be done by establishing a work-life harmony policy to offer clarity on after-hours work communication. The recommendations come a month after Prime Minister Lee Sen Lung announced that a new interagency task force has been convened to tackle the mental health needs of Singaporeans. Close to 5,800 build-to-order flats spread across seven housing projects in five estates were launched for sale by the Housing Board today in the final sales exercise for the year. The biggest project is Bishan Ridges, where about 1,500 two-room flexi, three-room and four-room flats are on offer. Besides Bishan, the other flats are spread across the mature towns of Topayo, Bidadari and Tampanese, as well as the non-mature towns of Sembawang and Tengah. In February next year, HDB will launch some 3,550 flats in Bukit Bato, Tengah, Kalangwampo and Topayo Bidadari. Another 3,870 flats will be offered in Bukit Merah, Geelang, Tengah and Woodlands next May. Now, hawker culture in Singapore could soon be internationally recognised after an expert panel recommended it to be inscribed on UNESCO's list of intangible cultural heritage. Multimedia journalist Rene Po finds out why Singaporeans love their hawker centres and the challenges faced by hawkers. Chicken rice, nasi biryani and laksa. These are just some of Singaporeans' favourite hawker centre dishes, which now have a chance of being recognised globally. This comes after an expert body recommended that hawker culture be inscribed as an official UNESCO intangible cultural heritage. I'm here at Topayo West Market and Food Centre. And from speaking to customers and hawkers, it's obvious that Singaporeans take pride in their hawker culture. I think the unique thing is, you know, uh, you can see it anywhere. And you can eat, order any, you know, the variety of food, uh, Indian food, Muslim food, Chinese, you know. Uh, my favorite store, uh, Lomi. Actually, the one I love one is at uh, uh, Henderson. Henderson Hawker Center. I think Hawker Center has been a lifestyle for sing all the Singaporean, and we were so used to eat the, with the hawker food. And because all this is a uh, very authentic food. Yeah, unlike those restaurants you can get anywhere. Yeah. Hawker culture has been around for decades but many fear that this iconic part of our heritage will die out one day. You know, a lot of people come to Hawker Centre because of this particular auntie or uncle, you know, that cooks this dish very well. Um, so if they, if they give up, you know, then that art is lost, right? Uh, yeah, so there must be some way of... And then the children maybe don't want to take, take on because it's a very tough life, you know. Uh, too many hawkers around. <laughs> so quite, quite, quite challenging, uh. You have to pay higher, I mean, not as high as coffee shop, but it's higher rank. Because 
we have nowadays we have to tender the place in order to get so the highest bidder can get the the, the place you see from a Singaporean perspective, I don't think it would die anytime soon because even for youngsters like us, we do go to hawker and it's, hawker is our to-go food. On whether Singapore will make it to the list, the Straits Times understands that those which have been approved by the evaluation body are typically given the go-ahead. A 24-member intergovernmental committee will give the final verdict in December this year. Until then, I'm going to savour my bowl of mee rebus. Renee Po for The Straits Times. Now, it goes without saying that parents would want the best for their children. But it can be hard knowing if they are going about their children's development the right way and whether it's likely to reap benefits. Well, parents who are watching, fret not as this will have you covered. ST Smart Parenting is one of our latest offerings that will give parents deeply researched information on what they can do to help their child thrive. As this team of education and parenting reporters will search out experts in different fields and get them to explain, verify and give advice to parents that will be useful and focused. The content will be made available in articles in print, online and videos. Now, I caught up with senior education correspondent Sandra Davy earlier who shared more on ST Smart Parenting. I understand the first few weeks, uh, the team is focusing on reading. So what are some of the uh, content that parents uh, can expect with regard to this topic? Okay, so we, we decided to focus on reading because that's about one of the most important mm. things that parents can do for their kids to help them, you know, uh, off to a good start uh, in, in school. And uh, we basically wanted to explain to parents what is it that the research says about reading? Why is it so important? You know, mm -hmm. so they need to understand that. You know, before they can even think about. Okay, so how do I then develop the habit uh, of reading? So in the first week, we focused on what the research shows. You know, and it's not just reading; it's reading for pleasure that makes all the difference in kids. You know, uh, and then because they must enjoy it. You know, mm -hmm. to to gain the full benefits of uh, reading and uh, we also explained how you know we, of course we, we all know that it has an impact on language skills vocabulary yeah. for example but it research also shows that it has an impact on maths you know achievement so how is that related mm -hmm. you know so we've explained all this in the first few weeks and then of course now with ebooks very, being very popular yeah. a lot of parents are asking you know uh, so can I use e-books with my kids because yeah. it's so convenient, right? You just don't need to lug around all these <laughs> books. Uh, and they come with these colourful pictures and graphics and sounds and games and what have you. Uh, Very multi-sensory kind yeah. of experience, right? Mm. But then again, you know, the, the research there shows that with very young kids, you mm. know, uh, when you're starting them off on reading uh, 0 to 5, really is printed books ah. that you should go back to okay, because okay. um, e-books just makes it almost too easy for the kids. They don't have to imagine, okay. they don't have to speculate, they don't have to think about the colour, you know. Mm. It does the work for them, e-books, you know, because everything is presented in, in huge, big uh, figures and colours and, you know, sounds and everything. Well, with a printed book, you know, a child, a parent will be asking the child, so what do you think a, an angry bear sounds like? And uh, the child has to imagine, uh, right? But in an e-book, you know, the, the, uh, there will be a button it, yeah. for a sound, you know, for that right. the bear, a hungry bear makes. Right. So, yeah, in a way, printed books are so much better. Mm. And uh, the, the, uh, last week, I uh, also covered, or rather this week, uh, we also did a story on how at the higher levels, because our kids are going online, they need to read very differently. So, you know, when a teacher asks you a question, it's no more going to a textbook that's been approved by MOE and finding the correct answer. You know, mm. Now you actually have to go to various sources online and different formats and then try and figure out what is right, what is wrong, yep. and what I can trust, what's the agenda behind these different sources. Mm you know, uh, what I can trust and then use the 
right information to understand right. an issue. You know? right. So it's, it's a lot more complex. It's right. a very different. And Sandra, what have been some of the feedback that parents have given you uh, regarding this new art, uh, vertical that we have? Are there right. any burning questions or topics that they want covered? So far, we've had very good feedback. Uh, we have uh, suggestions as well and what else needs to be covered and of course one of the big topics is the new PSLE scoring system yep. which we'll be covering in the weeks to come. Right yeah. and I also know that there is a newsletter that uh, parents can sign up for. Tell us more about that. Well uh, we have a newsletter that goes out to parents telling them what we have that week uh, in Smart Parenting uh, from the printed articles to the online articles uh, to the library of materials that we are building, including these wonderful videos that are being done by uh, experts from National Library, from the British Council, and uh, Eaton House. Yeah, uh, so far, mm -hmm. uh, and myself, of course, um, and there'll be many more. Uh, so in, in the weeks, months to come, we hope to keep this going for a long while. Mm -hmm. uh, we will have a very rich library of materials that parents can keep going back to yeah. uh, as their kids go through the different stages uh, to, to glean information, uh, to look for advice that they can use, you know, that would be really useful for them as parents. Right. Well, thank you so much, Sandra, for coming on to thank speak you. Uh, with us. Always a pleasure to speak with you. Now, that was our senior education correspondent, Sandra Devi, who shared more on one of the Straits Times' latest offerings, ST Smart Parenting, a guide for parents on what they can do to help their child thrive. Now, you can find the link to the site in the description below if you're watching us on YouTube. There is also the link to the newsletter that Sandra mentioned. You can find it there as well or you can visit straightstimes.com slash smartparenting. Let's take a look at the global headlines. Pfizer has launched a pilot delivery program for its experimental COVID-19 vaccine in four U.S. states. This as the U.S. drug maker seeks to address distribution challenges facing its ultra-cold storage requirements. It has selected Rhode Island, Texas, New Mexico and Tennessee for the program after taking into account their differences in overall size, diversity of populations and immunization infrastructure, as well as the state's need to reach individuals in varied urban and rural settings. The four states, however, will not receive vaccine doses earlier than other states by virtue of this pilot, nor will they receive any differential consideration. Several U.S. governors have imposed tighter restrictions to further contain the surge of the coronavirus as it threatens to overwhelm hospitals and claim more lives in the weeks ahead. Iowa, for example, have announced a 15-person limit for all indoor gatherings with restaurants and bars ordered to close by 10 p.m. and masks mandatory for anyone spending at least 15 minutes in an indoor space. More aggressive actions have been taken in places such as Philadelphia, which earlier ordered a ban on indoor gatherings of any size in any location, both public and private. Closer to home, South Korean officials say they will impose stricter social distancing rules for the greater Seoul area starting today, a month after it had eased them. The tighter curbs include a ban on public gatherings of 100 people or more, a limit on religious services and audiences at sporting events to 30% capacity and a requirement for high-risk facilities like clubs and karaoke bars to broaden distance among guests. They are watching this all unfold via these three displays. Well, 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 it's a mission success. Four astronauts riding a newly designed SpaceX spacecraft have docked with the International Space Station, the first crewed mission on a privately built space capsule purchased by NASA. The Crew Dragon capsule, piloted by three Americans and a Japanese astronaut, docked 27 hours after launching from Florida. The ISS will be their home for the next six months until another set of crew replaces them. 
Well, those are our top stories for today. For more news and videos, visit straightstimes.com and remember to subscribe to our YouTube channel by hitting the red button below. Once again, I'm Harianto Diman. Join us tomorrow for more stories on The Big Story.